Most day camps like to think that they are an inclusive environment, yet few actually take the steps needed to truly walk the walk and include young people with needs who are given equal footing during the school year at their schools. In this annual topic of a podcast, we'll further explore the complexities and benefits of running a great day camp inclusion program. This is the day camp pod. Cue the music. Da. Welcome back, my friends, to the Day Camp Podcast. I'm Andy Pritikin, Director of Liberty Lake in the Philly Burbs of New Jersey. I'm Sam Thompson from Crystal Lake, Illinois, Crystal Lake Park District. And I'm Aaron Gluckstein from Camp Robinhood, located just outside of Toronto in Canada. We are day camp professionals joining forces to provide a forum for summer camp pros like you to share ideas and best practices across North America and beyond. Today, we are joined by Lucia Tenson and Terry Sutherland to further the discussion of day camp inclusion. All right, Lucia, we're, we're going to start with you. Um, I just hope that your husband, Dave, is not, you know, a little like, you know, oh, a little miffed. My wife gets to be on the podcast before she does, you know, before he does. It's like, well, you got to yeah. say, Andy, it's quite an honor. So thank you so much for having me today. You're welcome, man. We'll, we'll definitely get Dave on here soon. Um, he is, you know he is he'll love the, it. He is one of the great minds and talkers of day camping, um, and uh, we do really think alike. So, um, so I, we, Lucia and I met at the national conference uh, where I gave a session on inclusion, and Lucia wa was a big part of helping chime in uh, because, frankly, she's got more experience in it than I do. Um, I'm fortunate because we got Terry Sutherland, who uh, we'll be talking to next. But, Lucia, tell us about uh, how you got into camp and all the way up to uh, Tamarack and all. So um, my husband and I, Dave and I own Tamarack Day Camp. We've owned it for the last 20 years, but Tamarack has been in existence for the last 72 years. It is actually on the outside of Chicago in the suburbs and um, it was my college job. So I worked there in college. I was actually the first counselor that was hired by the previous owner. I went on to do many things and he always joked, if my kids don't want the business, you need to come back and run it. And I always jokingly said, yeah, when my youngest is five, that'd be a great idea. So wait, 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 how old were you when he told you that? Okay, so I was 22, <laughs> dating Dave, and I had no children. And oh I decided gosh. at that point, sure, when my youngest child, whatever child that would be, was five years old, I probably could work as a director. <laughs> uh, so subsequently, my, Dave went on to a career and I am, um, my background's in education, so I've taught at both uh, elementary, preschool, graduate school um, level. And we were living in Nashville on New Year's Eve of 2000. And the, Harley, the previous owner called and said, you know what, I wanna retire. You guys need to move home. So we navigated all of that. And so we've owned it since 2000. So this is our 20th year. We also run a school in the off season. So we have preschoolers from two to five years old and we do inclusion both at preschool and we also do it at camp. How did we get into it? Yeah. It was just seemed like the natural progression. Um, for camp, I remembered vividly our first year, there was a mom who'd been at Tamarack before us with her two other children and she had a, a young son with autism and had previously not been able to come to camp and said, kind of said to us, what can you do to make this happen? And we kind of worked as we all do collectively as a community and he started with us as a four-year-old and I'm now really proud to say he is a, has been a counselor with us for the last three years. So we've watched his whole progression. And as you start that journey, as we all know, whenever you start something you're passionate and you love, you start making those connections with school districts that have special needs children and parents and families. And it just naturally starts to happen. And you know, with 13% of children with special needs we, and 20% of the households impacted, you just wanna make sure that you're as inclusive as you can be realistically within your setting. Right. So, I mean, like a lot of camps sort of dip their toe in inclusion because we have big hearts. We're camp people with big right. hearts, right? I think the, uh, the tough part is being really intentional about it, you know, once, once, you, start, once you start getting successful, right? Uh, and and it, I think, uh, you know, as I mentioned on the last time we talked about this was that, you know, I'm 53 years old and I was a school teacher in my 20s. And 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 my childhood, these children that we're talking about with needs, many of them were sort of kept apart, right? But nowadays, that is just not the case. Inclusion has been normal since my kids who are in their twenties now. They they were in inclusion classes, and it's just normal. But I think a lot of people who run camps are older, and they remember the old model, and they don't quite realize what the norm is in education nowadays. 
Right. Lucia, the, the parents of special needs children talk a lot too, and they're a very tight knit group. So once you do a good job with them, you start ballooning and it takes off on its own. I think one of the other ad resources that we find are the school districts. I think once the school districts recognize that you do it well, they're reaching out at all times about a child that's in their care or is there a possible program and things like that as well. So it's nice not only through a parent perspective, but also keeping that educational perspective as well as we move them into a camp setting. Right. And I think more and more parents now, as we get older, more and more parents, like you think about parents in their 30s, they probably grew up in inclusion classrooms or close to it. Right. Oh, it was absolutely. around that time. Yes. Okay. All right, so also with us this uh, week, we have Terry Sutherland, who is an expert in the world of special needs because she spent her whole life basically in it. So Terry, unmute yourself and tell us. About it. So I uh, have been in special education for almost 40 years. I recently retired, but I got into the camp setting through uh, scouting. My husband and I were scout parents for many, many, many years, and we always had the extra special needs kids in our troop and in our group because we were able to work with them and provided that support. I ran Cub Scout Day Camp for 14 years and would always hear about this amazing day camp, Liberty Lake, that my Cub Scouts would go to on the alternate weeks they weren't with me. I realized it was right down the street and when my Cub Scout turned 25, I decided <laughs> to retire from Cub Scouting and check out Liberty Lake. I started there as the teen leadership uh, director because at Cub Scouts, I had taken the older scouts and trained them to work and run the programming for the younger scouts. So I just parlayed that into Liberty Lakes teen leadership program. And then recently I was able to move into the inclusion program, which was just a wonderful opportunity. The inclusion program has grown with so much support from Andy and, and everybody there that it has just been an amazing transition and it is growing um, a little frighteningly, but we are keeping up. <laughs> so, so, so Terry, right out of college, right? Didn't you go start working in group homes? Oh, absolutely. So my husband and I, we got married on Friday or on Saturday. I graduated from college on Friday, got married on Saturday, went to Florida in the rainy season, came back and became a mom of five autistic children. <laughs> my husband and I ran that group home for a year and then moved back into education and having our own kids. But that's how we started out. Right. And, and in the school district, the, you've worked in all different levels, right? Because you worked with preschoolers all the way up to high school kids. And now you're with 19 and 20 year olds. That's absolutely right. I started the preschool. I've always worked with children that are classified as emotionally disturbed and autistic. And the behavior program has always been my thing. And yes, now I am retired, but subbing long term at special services with the transition campus, getting them ready for hopefully work skills. Yeah, it, it's such a nice thing to have someone like, like Terry's caliber on staff. And Lord knows there's lots of special ed teachers out there, folks, that you could have an employment. And, and I have to say that out of our staff of 200 plus people, we probably have like a dozen legit, you know, not even counting the ones in this inclusion program. Like, of course, then there's another 75, but, but you know, of just people working around on camp. It's just such a great thing to have because the tools that a special education teacher has, they just transfer to all typical kids. And they're just great for, especially teaching counselors who are not education majors and stuff, like laymen, you know, how to deal with people at real sort of concrete, you know, intentional levels, right? So, all right, so let's, let's start uh, with, with the big question. Like, you know, we talked about why do inclusion, like we have, we have big hearts, right? Um, but what about the benefits for other campers? Uh, Lucia, Lucia what, what do you think? Or Terry, you, this is, this is, this, we want your opinions. We want some new opinions. Now, we're really lucky because Sam and Aaron, right. you know, also run camps that have awesome inclusion programs. I mean, this is a rare moment to have so many people involved in camp, you know, that, that are involved in inclusion on one thing. Um, but yeah, let's talk about the benefits to other campers. Oh, they're beyond belief, in my opinion. Um, so at Tamarack, we have two um, inclusion specialists that work with both our staff and our children, aside from the um, counselors that are working with our special needs children. It is one of those things where we've actually done some outcome data of groups that, you know, what is their, what's their take when they've had a child with special needs? The counselors, retention seems to be higher. 
the um, kindness level, there's just so much benefit for both your staff and for your children in terms of being able to adjust to different situations, being accepting of different things that arise. It's really kind of driven why we teach social emotional learning throughout camp. I think camps, every camp does it, but we do it intentionally through two periods um, a day on social emotional learning. And how are we working as a group? How do we include children with varying needs? How do we problem solve? I just, you just see it as a, you hate to say it, it sounds corny, but a kinder, gentler world when you've got children with special needs within your groups. I think everybody takes an extra breath. They look a little bit deeper into themselves. And I think we all learn. And I think we, I think my typical campers learn as much, if not far more, from their children with varying needs so that we're within their group. I don't know, Terry, what do you think? Well, I agree with what you said, but in addition to that, I see the young staff who have grown up with inclusion having that opportunity to change lives a little bit more than they did just sitting yep. next to Johnny in class, but actually taking that opportunity to help those kids make friends and support them socially. That is the biggest part, that social integration. We can adapt softball, baseball, we can get bigger paintbrushes, but we have to really get down to that social level where that acceptance is, where we have that child with low self-esteem and some social distancing problems, social difficulties, that they can actually take that step up and feel that confidence. And I've heard from people, when the kids go back to school in September, they're a different child. They have that new level of confidence and that's so important. Yeah intelligence seems to you know they they're not in their own head anymore they're starting to look at the world around them more and um, how can we adapt to differences when you say social emotional learning Lucia I think the the biggest part of that is empathy and that's really what you're hitting on there you know and it, it's teaching these kids empathy you know put yourself in those in that person's shoes kind of stuff and and one thing that you said made me think about something that i've said often to my colleagues which is that at the end of the summer i get just as many thank you notes and emails from the parents of typical children about the, that those kids in their group right than i do from the parents of those kids because it's just, it's so impactful to them. It really does teach them kindness. And I'll be honest, it has to be taught. I mean, we do, you know, at camp, and I'm sure at all of yours as well, we, we role play. So we have a class that's called STAR that is taught for each group every week on scenarios. What happens, not just for a special needs child, but for you, so for my five-year-old, what happens when you get out of kickball? How do you manage that? What happens when your friend gets out? How, do you, how are you a good teammate? That social emotional intelligence just plays to all of camp. So I mean, we're typically, and you would say, oh, that's great for your younger kids. I'm telling you my 14 and 15 year olds benefit from it as much as my four year olds. And you know, that great piece of having it taught by, you know, as we all look at our camps, kind of that young, cool 20 something. So they're still really relatable but they're the ones teaching the curriculum through the scenarios. And we do different scenarios every week with every group. And, you know, my parents will call it recess survival skills. It's what happens when you're out at recess and nobody will play <laughs> with you or somebody takes your ball or you're dying to join that basketball game and you have no idea how. So, yeah. Oh my goodness. That was phenomenal. Recess survival skills. Put that in the show notes. Oh, I'm Doesn't telling you, than... that's what we call it. It's, it's, <laughs> it's that survival. Cause you ask any parent, um, of younger children, what do you worry about most? They don't, in coming out of preschool, they don't care about, they, they want readiness skills, but they want to make sure their child has someone to sit next to at lunch and someone to play with on the playground. And how do we foster those skills? And that extrapolates out for our older campers as well. Yeah. And I think integrity is a big part of it for our camp, well for our star points that we really are intentional about doing the right thing because it's the right thing to do. And when you have opportunities to do that, whether it's with a special needs child or someone else in your group, and that can be recognized and reinforced. It's such a strong lesson for kids on all level. I think it's great practice. I just hope that people listening to this that don't have inclusion programs in their camp, that, they, that they're connecting the dots and seeing that this, falls, this should fall right in line with your mission of what you're doing at your camp. And it, it is actually helpful, right? Most of the most of, the parent, most of the camp directors I speak to that are hesitant to do this, they're so worried that it's going to negatively impact the, the, 
the experience of the typical kids. And it does not, it, that is a fallacy. It's just a fear. It's a normal fear that people, it's a fear of the unknown. And like I said, actually, it's a, go ahead. Sorry, sorry, no, for us, it's, it's actually been a, also a great way to, to draw in some uh, more mature staff because uh, you know, we, our staff generally are skewed to a, a younger uh, demographic and, and to get some of the people who are you know, uh, at a crossroads in their lives or, or you know, going into uh, healthcare or teaching, education, other educational related fields, you know, to get those people to, to take a summer and come work uh, at camp. Uh, you know, th these opportunities provided uh, to work as a one-to-one -one or, or in an integrated uh, group really, uh, really does uh, bring some high quality people to us. All right, let's talk about the being proactive about this, being really intentional about this and making sure most of my friends who run camps that don't have you know, real inclusion programs like we do, their biggest thing is like, oh, these parents, they sign their kids up and we don't know anything about them. And then we find out week three that the kids got all these issues and all that kind of thing. So Lucia, what do you guys do at, uh, at, at Tamarack to ensure that you guys get enough information before day one? That's a great question. And I'll be honest, I think we've matured in that as our program's gone on. That intentionality is so important, but we really, if a child with special needs or in an active IEP joins our camp family, um, I'll go out and I do a school visit. So um, parents sign a release, we partner with the school district and I'm able to see that child within the school setting, the advantages of being a day camp. And we really get a chance to find out what's working for that child with those teachers because they are your greatest source of what's working and what's not. So we do that. And then once I've been able to observe that, we circle back with parents talk about that observation because we really want to keep at four, at least for Tamara, that 60% mark. I really want to make sure Dave does and our staff that they're included in typical activities with some, mod some slight modification 60% of their day. And some children that's, that, doesn't fit, that doesn't fit our programming and then we become those camp advocates or what are some other programs we can recommend. But then from there, it's a whole process of having parents come in and we have parents meet with their counselors. So not only just the forms with that personal touch. So meeting with the unit leader who's the teacher, meeting with our two behavioral specialists, meeting with either Dave or I and their group counselor. And we bring the young, the, the camper with them and we do part of it with the camper and then part of the camper goes off on a tour with their new exciting counselors. And parents can tell us what they're scared of. What are they worried about? What are their visions for this summer? And how can we t help them meet that through their experience at Tamarack? And then it's having your, you know, your behavioral specialist, your learning specialist on a set schedule to make sure they're calling parents at, you know, Tuesday at 8.30, that's your standing call about Johnny and his progress at camp. Aside from the typical progress they get is just being a camper at Tamarack, making sure that our inclusion specialists flow into groups so that they're extra eyes for our counselors and that they're seamless in there. And they're supporting not just the one-on-ones, but those group counselors. Um, making sure they're giving a typical experience as they can be. And just that follow up all the way through. So just out of curiosity, Lucia. Sure. So, so I signed my kid up at your camp, uh -huh. who's on the spectrum, let's say. Uh -huh. How are you finding it? How, what's, what, what's the flag that's making you know this? So what's the it happens. So it happens, through our in, it happens through our intake process when asking about, as you look at a camper profile, we, some people term it, does your child have a 504 IEP? We term it, does your child receive special services? And we leave it open-ended with some guidance. So, cause we're not just looking for that 504 IEP, we're also looking for, is it a language delay, you know, that may not have been picked up on an IEP because it's, or some social skills that the school that isn't, doesn't have educational impact. So the, so the school district isn't acting on it, but parents are. And then looking at that and then that, that phone call to a parent and say, okay, talk me through, let's talk through it together. Let's talk about Tamarack. And then let's talk about those steps that we can take before camp starts to make sure one, that Tamarack is the right fit for your child. And two, that we have no regression over the summer. I always tell the, you know, I always tell my friend, you know, teachers and counselors, we don't want regression. We want to make sure that we're moving a child forward and we at least, at least leave them as intact as they left school in May, as in, as they return in August. But I mean, ideally, of course, we want leaps and bounds growth and all of that as well. 
Interesting. Yes, you, you definitely have to set up some almost like a tripwire for parents because uh, they may not call you, right? If you're lucky enough to get a phone call and you have a conversation, that's one thing. But sometimes people just sign up because their friends said it was a great place. Absolutely. And then you just get a registration flying through, right? There needs to be something in there that's going to get them, you know, that doesn't seem threatening, that seems like we're trying to help here kind of thing. And, and I just I have to say that. But gets that conversation started. We're just looking for a conversation starter with parents that's right. authentic. And, and just and, so you understand the change of, of times, like when I started doing this 25 plus years ago, people were really hesitant to put that information down anywhere. They really thought it was a black mark against their kid. Mm -hmm. And and I think that times have the pendulum has completely gone to the other side now. Now parents are looking for <laughs> support any way they can right? I don't want to say excuses, but some, some of them, they just want some kind of anything, you know. Sometimes people, it seems like they want their kid diagnosed, as opposed to 25 years ago when that was the complete opposite. Right. And some, Andy, have been treated badly, so they won't come clean in the beginning. Um, and you, when you go through their medical forms and you see the medicine you're on, you're like, oh, I need to have a conversation with this parent because we know that this goes for these different things. Um, so they've got to trust us and is we can have it's good to have all that in place but we're still going to have a few surprises what do they do at, at your camp sam in regards to the um how do you guys know that somebody has the potential besides looking at their medications um there is a form they're supposed to fill out when they register um and there's it says on there to you know contact me and that we need two weeks before um, they could attend camp just so we can prepare. And a lot will do that. I just had a, a woman who moved in from out of state a couple weeks ago that uh, sent a lengthy uh, description, which was wonderful. Um, because then you can pair them with somebody that you can pair them up with somebody that you already have on staff if they fit the same uh, talents with that child. Um, we do, then they have to do their forms. Sometimes we'll catch it then in the medical, or sometimes you'll catch it as they get off the bus that first day and um, you can see the signs and you know, I need to ask if there's some support from somewhere else, so. Right. All right, Terry, so, so why don't you talk about uh, what we do at Liberty Lake in regards to you know, before, before the first day of camp kind of stuff. And, and by the way, we always think that we're being pretty thorough and you listen to Lucia going into people's classrooms. Holy I know, mother. right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so we do um, a pretty formal intake. We have uh, the button on our Camp Minder application that says, um, does your child have a 504 or an IEP? And that clicks you to another page of a few questions. And that prompts um, myself and my partner, Gail, to get involved and we send out a parent packet with information. And that's followed up with an intake appointment. So we have uh, the parent and child come hopefully on an open house day where we have the opportunity to walk through the camp and use the facility. We split up, Gail will take the child, I'll take the parents and we'll bring them back together. We do a similar kind of intake. Uh, we contact the school, we get the recent IEP, we do a teacher questionnaire. Uh, after we've gotten a release and we do a behaviors questionnaire and special services questionnaire. We get all that information together as much as we can be as supportive as we can to parents. And the next step that we have found really helpful is what we call a summer success plan. We put together a toolbox, a mini IEP for summer, doesn't talk about diagnosis, anything like that, but it has specific tools that will help that child become successful at camp. Literally things like needs five extra minutes to process directions, you know, when he gets upset and gets out at kickball, take a little walk and he'll be fine. Specifics like that that help those counselors, the specialist, anybody who's going to deal with that child to help them be successful. I also add loves to talk about Thomas the Train because that's going to help that new kid feel better at camp that first day. I send it to the parent first so they can look it over. Sometimes that will definitely signal them to say, oops, I forgot to tell you this happens or he doesn't do this anymore, let's take that out. It comes back to me, Gail and I make a million copies and make sure that everyone that works with that child has that little summer success toolbox. And we have found that it has been very successful that the counselors, the specialists, all the staff really appreciate that little bit of knowledge and the parents have given us a lot of good feedback too. It's really worked well. Yeah, I we're gonna put my 
a session from ACA National, the PDF of it on our show notes so that people will be able to see samples of what Terry was talking about. Right, before we go to our next thing, I, I just, I just want to uh, give a shout out to one of our sponsors, AM Skyer, though, that one of the leading insurance brokers for the finest camps of America for almost 100 years. AM Skyer has been a strategic partner with summer camps, supporting our needs arising in PR, legal issues, health, facility, and more. And, you know, 100 years, but it's their first pandemic. Yay! So they're working really hard, my friends at AM Scar. I want to give them a shout out uh, and thank them for all the support they've been giving. They really, they're looking for ways to help their camps uh, during this, uh, this time that they really need it. Um, all right. So I just wanted to, uh, before we go on to the next question that we had, I, I want to just talk about inclusion, the word inclusion for a second, because I think it's important because Lucia mentioned um, we want our kids to, to be involved in at least 60% of activity. That's nice that she's so mathematical about it. I think we're, we're more general about it. But um, it, it's really important to, to explain like what, what you feel. And I'll, I would tell you my thing, but I think people have heard it before. So let's go to Lucia and then we'll go to Terry. Let's just talk of, and, and Sam, please define inclusion for the layman's out there. Anyone you can go first. I guess for me, um, it's that they can do the activities the other kids are doing with a little tweak or added support, um, but they're still doing what the other campers are doing. So um, I, I don't have a percentage on it, but the bigger the percentage, the better, uh, so that they're getting more out of the program. I think for us, it's a little more individualized, and we have seen kids who are able to engage just by watching and listening to the music and rocking along with the uh, singing that's going on, but maybe are nonverbal. And what we do is talk to the parents in the school and get some sort of goal for the summer. And if the parents' goal is that they can just be there with that group, with that smile on their face, listening to the music, maybe they have to stand to the side, they have to have headphones on for the noise, whatever it is, they are enjoying that activity. They are engaged to the best of their ability. We don't really have a percentage point. We look at it individually. We want them to be able to engage and we, won't, we want them to be able to be comfortable, but it looks different with every kid. It absolutely looks different for every kid. Um, I think what when I think of inclusion, I think when Tamarack looks at inclusion, we look at it in terms of fostering typical peer interaction. So, so many of our children with varying needs come from classes that are fairly structured, fairly rigid during the school day because they're working on those IEP goals. So when they get to camp, we want to foster those play skills, um, making sure that at the lunch table, they're included in the conversation. They may not be verbally contributing, but that the conversation is directed to them so that they are able to, to contribute in the way that they're comfortable. When they go to baseball, that their needs are met with modifications, but they're still getting the feeling they're part of a bigger team. They're part of the team and they're participating in the way that fits most for them. So for us in inclusion, it's all about trying to foster typical um, peer relations, just getting a chance to be with friends, make a friend. I mean, that to me is the thing that for me is, is the goal for every one of our campers at camp, whether they're inclusion or typical, to walk away and make a new friend or maintain a friendship that's not a counselor, that's not an adult. How can we also foster those children's friendships as well? So inclusion, you're right, Terry, right on the money. It's different for every child in every way. And it's just making sure that we do our best to make sure they're not an island. Sometimes you see campers that go to fabulous camps that are happy and safe, but they're an island. They're not benefiting enough from what's going on around them. And for every parent, there's a different goal. And we want to make sure that we're meeting those goals for those campers. Yeah, you speak so elegantly about this stuff. It's really great. The you know, inclusion means level, level playing field. And you guys, all three of you mentioned the same thing, that it's it's more than just having a big heart and bringing these kids in and, and being accepting for them to be here. Like you said, Lucia, like an island, right? That's a great metaphor. Um, it's the next level. It's making those modifications. And like Sam said, they could just be small tweaks, right? You know, Terry's always making recommendations, bigger paint brushes, you know, softer balls, like things like that. These are not super expensive things when you consider what camp tuition is. I think, so. I think one, 
sorry. I think one no, one uh, one element, uh, you know, that a lot of camps uh, have been doing uh, and more and more uh, more and more as time goes on is is also have you know providing positive role models that also have uh, you know special needs. And um, Lucia, you, met, you mentioned that earlier that you had somebody who came up through the ranks as a four, you know, from a four year old to uh, you know to the second year staff member. And we have a number of those too at Robin Hood, and it's you know it's nothing you know can you know. Um, warms the heart more and can give parents confidence in knowing that, you know, their kid can, uh, you know, it, you know, has, has a huge level of potential, uh, than when, you know, you place them in a cabin, uh, you know, a child, uh, uh, with a new diagnosis in a cabin with a, uh, you know, a counselor that has, you know, been through our the ranks at Robin Hood and, uh, grown and learned and, uh, you know, become, some, you know, a successful independent, uh, you know, individual. So I think it's a great part of the inclusive environment for us. And Lucia also mentioned that it's, it, it may not work out, right? You know, we'll, we'll try it, we'll give us all the information, we'll do our best, but if your kid can't be part of what we're trying to do, then that's not inclusion, right? We're not taking them on to be an island, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, <clears throat> and the parents have to understand that. And, and that's part of that, of that coaching before the, the summer starts that this may not be the right program for you if it takes, if it takes too much. Um, and I think some, sorry, along those lines, Andy, some, some camp directors, I know Sari, uh, the owner at Robin Hood has become an expert on, you know, all programs related to uh, kids with additional needs and often makes recommendations to parents and they turn to her, a parent who w was never able to send their child to, to Robin Hood will call her, you know, a number of times for five years, uh, you know, for recommendations and guidance, and uh, she's become that you know coach to many many families, uh, whether they've been Robin Hood campers or not. I actually yeah. talked to Sari at Nationals about um, a child I have that we've had for four years, and um, we've done a contract with a parent. His role, our role, or, you know, and he's just not making progress. So this may not be the camp for him, but it's heartbreaking to have to cut them loose, which I know when we talked earlier, I'll open that up to everyone, but um, I had to lean on her shoulder at nationals because I've got to call and talk to that parent before camp. Yeah, it's tough. You know, we're big hearted people and these kids, you know, they, they appreciate camp more than anyone and certainly their parents do too. It's a, it's a respite for them. So yes, so we're not, we're not we're we're not a uh, a camp for everybody, but yet, you know, and we're not we're not a special needs camp, right? We are a typical kids camp. Um, you know, I'm sure there's day camps out there listening that are special needs camps. God bless you guys. But also, but we do tell our staff at Liberty Lake that we are all inclusion counselors. We are all part of the inclusion team, right? There's not just inclusion people, right? We are all part of it. So I'm curious. What kind of training, Lucia, do you guys do with your regular staff? So Andy, I totally agree that they are all, that, they, that our counselors are counselors to everybody, including our, inclu our inclusion aides, or uh, we, call them, we call them shadow counselors in different names. They, you know, I always say to them, your goal is to connect with the other campers so that they have no idea that you're solely there for one camper. That you connected, you're tying the shoes of someone and moving around, still keeping that child in your line of sight, but at the same time, you move in and out of that group as a member of a cohesive unit for them. Um, for training, we do a couple of things. We start, I think, as all camps do in orientation, setting that groundwork for all of our campers because there's so many campers with hidden disabilities um, that you know still need that extra you know, sportsmanship, confidence. So we work with talking through scenarios. We talk about what um, my friend Michael Brandwine says it, what, says it the best, and it's something we've adopted is that level two skills. Anyone can teach swimming. Anyone can teach shooting a basketball. But what are you really teaching? When you shoot a basketball, what are you teaching? You're teaching compassion. You're teaching sportsmanship. You're, you're teaching everything from waiting your turn. What is it? We talked, we do a lot during orientation of breaking that down. How you do you teach swimming? It's not about learning the breaststroke, though it's great that they pass the Red Cross level. It's so much more about celebrating what they do. And we try and start with that foundation because what's good for our inclusion kids is equally, if not better, for our typical peers. 
So that's right. what we found that best practices are the way to go. Best practices all around are uh, what you need to reinforce. And then you expand that for certain circumstances. You talk about scenarios. The best practices overall are what all kids need. And that really works best. Yeah, well, one thing we've uh, we've shifted from uh, big time at Liberty Lake over the last few years is staying away from diagnoses and just sticking with like what this kid needs, right? What 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 are the things that this kid likes? What do they don't like? What are their triggers? You know, and just and just treating them like the whole kid and not that special kid, right? Because every kid's got their quirks, right? Well, this is this kid's quirk, and I think that's really important. Is is that language? I think, um, and and for those of, of us that are in the special needs world, it is like another language, right? The layman, people who have no idea about this kind of world, we just make mistakes when we talk about this stuff constantly. And it's taken me years to, to talk better about this kind of thing. So I think that in staff training, that's part of it. That's like basic 101 is how to talk about these things, right? And and not uh, not make these kids feel like outcasts unintentionally. Um, all right, so, uh, you know, we're, we're winding down. We, we're going to get to the camp tip of the week soon. Um, but I want to talk about this, this last thing uh, that Lucia mentioned a little bit at first, and I know Sam has talked about it, and it's something that Terry and I have talked about in the past, is what happens when these kids start aging out? What happens when they start getting older? What can we do with them legitimately? You know, at Liberty Lake, before Terry was involved in the inclusion program, we were like, oh, well, we'll have them wipe down the lunch tables and this and that. Like, we, we thought that would be just this great idea. And we realized that after about five minutes, they were done, <laughs> unless there was somebody that was like trained in that kind of thing to be working with them, that this is a real thing. And as I'm wearing, you know, my, my BCIT shirt right now, I know that that's a big part of what they do in the high schools is teach this job coaching kind of stuff. So um, Sam, Lucia, go at it. T tell us, uh, give us some guidance here. Um, Lucia can speak to it um, more in depth. I was just gonna say that as middle management, sometimes you're not in control over getting to keep them hired. Um, I had a quadriplegic that worked for me for a few years and he um, had a nurse, full-time nurse, and he, he could move by blowing in the tube. So what he wanted us to do was put snack on his lap and everyone would come up and pick from the snack bin and they'd all have to say hi to JJ and do that. And then they were comfortable with him. So then he taught them chess and he did a great job. Um, I have had other people that I wanted to keep hired and was not able to for varying reasons. Um, I do have one seizure disorder and one developmentally delayed staff uh, still on my staff right now, and they've been here for 15 years. So, Lucia. So we currently this year have nine, on, we'll have nine on staff. Um, all of them have come from, some of them have grown up with us. Some of us, some of them have worked because we're also a school site. They've been um, working with us through neighboring school districts as their work placement and things like that. And they do have, some have job coaches, some are now working independently. So we have like one staff member who has a full-time job coach who is with her at all times. Standing back very much like you're include, you know, working with an inclusion camper, working on breaking a task down that she can be successful. But then we also have counselors with varying needs that I would challenge you to walk into that group and tell me who they are because they've grown in their role through repetition and through coaching and always being, you know, one of the cool things about staff. And I'm Sam, I think you'd say the same thing is when you pair a, a child that's gone or a young adult who's gone past needing a job coach, but they still need that guidance, that support, that and and then picking that typical peer as a counselor and saying to them, and working with them, that relationship where their your counselors, do, your very needs counselors, doing their job, but at the same time, they've always got a friend. Yeah, you know, they've always got a friend in that counselor who's right there to make sure that they're successful as well. So it's working through. But it, I mean, we added a second inclusion specialist this year that's solely working with our job coaching program. So managing our job coaching, our job coaches managing kind of the documentation and data to make sure we're being successful. And most importantly, going in and continuing to build up our staff that are working with those counselors to make sure that they are continuing to be 
their very best in terms of empathy and support and not just doing it for them. So a couple questions. Do these, so they're getting paid, these young people? The council, our, yeah. our counselors? Absolutely. And, and, and you have to shell out the money for this job coach, right? I mean, this, this is not some little thing. So it goes both thing. ways. Yeah. So it can be that we'll do it in partnership with parents because mm -hmm. they want their child there in the coaching role. So they'll help offset the cost of the job coach. But yes, mm -hmm. the young, the counselor that's working for us is absolutely getting a paycheck. And most right. of the time, that paycheck offsets the cost of the job coach. So gotcha. it works out. It's, so it's a really cool thing. Oh, that's great. That, that's you a good know, way to look at it. The coach is getting paid, paid by parents, but the child is getting that money back in a paycheck. So it's just, it, it feels, it just feels good all the way around for everybody. And then you, you know, you get into your money management skills and all of that, because you can't have a counselor that I don't know how you all do payday, but it's our, you know, it's our Friday lineup and, you know, the, the unit leaders quietly hand out checks and you can't have a, you know, you can't have a counselor who's not getting that check. Yeah. Yeah. Direct deposit. Well, they still get their stubs though, because it's such a cool thing for them. It's, uh, we, you know, it's kind yeah. of a rite of passage. Oh, that's nice. That's really nice. So Lucia and I will be touching base about the job coach situation because that was our next step for Liberty Lake. And we had gotten together with another school and set everything up to meet in the spring and talk about a, a definite start in an SLE, a structured learning environment situation with job coaches and then pandemic. So we will still be working on that and I will definitely touch base with you to get more information on some of the ins and outs that you have already been through. It'll be great. What and one of the things when you're doing that story that we've learned also, it's as much a job coach counselor position as it is a parent education piece for those counselors that have um, bearing needs because it's really hard for parents to let go in a work environment. It, it's such a big step for them. And so for us, we've learned that we have to be intentional also with our parent education piece with our, for our counselors with bearing needs as well. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So before we get to the tip of the week, and by the way, Terry, I'm doing what I did with Brandy. I'm, I'm, I'm directing a tip of the week to you because there's one thing I want you to talk about that we did. I think is super cool. Um, but um, before we do that, I want to give a shout out again to another awesome sponsor that's really coming through during this whole pandemic season that we're experiencing. And it's the American Camp Association, New York and New Jersey, dedicated to preserving, promoting and enhancing the quality of the summer camp experience. Uh, ACA New York, New Jersey, after they got back from Tri-State, immediately became a web-based professional development like warehouse. And they started uh, bringing on awesome speakers and putting on great webinars, which are recorded and free free to ACA members and go to the ACANYNJ.org website and access them. There's some super resources there for all. So thank you to the crew there. We really appreciate it. All right. So tip of the week. So Terry, what I, if, if you would, I would love for you to talk about the Harmony Hut because I really think that's a cool thing that you came up with that is, is pretty special. Okay. The Harmony Hut is some place that we put together that is a calming place that kids can go. They're supervised, but they need a place to, to diffuse, get that anger out, and be ready to return to the group. So we took a little shed, it's a cabin size, and opened it up, and we put in a soft foam floor and beanbag chairs. We have a sand pit out front with sand toys. We have a large Rubbermaid tub that has every sensory toy that I could think of in there. And we have a beautiful tree behind it that has two teardrop swings, the kind that kids can just sit in and spin around. Uh, the counselor or the advocate, the one-to-one -one can bring the child there. They first radio me that I know they're there and they spend some time just allowing the child to, whatever they need to do, kick and scream on the beanbag chair, play with the sensory stuff. We have a weighted blanket, like I said, whatever I could think of. And it has just really been a great thing for kids to know that they have, that they can ask to go there. I put it on the summer success card that says, HH, Harmony Hut, this child would benefit from that. So it's worked out really well. That's our Harmony Hut. Right. And for those of you that are not in the special needs world, I, we cannot overstate how important tactile things are for these kids. How, and, you know, for, for those of us that don't have any, you know, additional needs, when we get upset and lose it, you know, that's hard enough. 
for these kids, it's really hard for them to bring it back. So to have them go to a special place where they can sort of chill and take their time and no one's pushing them and no one's staring at them and all that kind of thing, it really has been a great thing to watch. All right, Miss Lucia. I, Terry, I love the Harmony Hut. We call it the calming place at our, at our camp, but it's that, how much fun. I love the idea of the te teardrop swings. That's great. We don't have that. I love that. Mine is, my tip of the week is simple. It's a management technique that I think benefits every camper. Um, it's, it's simply an envelope that the unit, unit leader for the group has. They have three. They're really cool and decorated and they're in their um, backpack. And when a child looks like they need a break, whether it's one of my inclusion children or it's a child that's just having a tough time and could benefit from a walk, they get to be the lucky ones who get to take the secret. They get to take the, the unit leader who's our teacher will say, will you take this to Miss to Lucia? Or will you take this to arts and crafts, depending on how long a walk they need. And it's a color coded envelope that they pull out and give to the child. The child's so excited to drop it off. The minute the counselor gets it, they know it's color coded. They know this child needed a break. So they need, they engage this child in a conversation. If the child, depending on the color of the writing on the envelope, if they need an extra long break, that that person who received the note will take a little bit of time rewriting a note, engaging them in a change in atmosphere. Then they put an they take that, they put a note back in that envelope, and that child takes it back. So you get a chance of getting getting to take a break and take a walk. You get to have a job and be a leader. And then you're also getting engaged by one of the counselors that you're taking the note to. Um, you know, it might be for that child a favorite activity. So it may be taking it to Ralph in nature or whatever. And it's so simple. And it's so easy and all the counselors are keyed into the fact when they see an envelope, they know what that child, you know, what we perceive that child needs at the moment. Wow. That is super cool. <laughs> that is, it, well, it's, what, it's one of those things that people talk about, like, oh, we should do this, but you guys actually did it. <laughs> it's really neat. Do you have a name for it, Lucia? Is it like messenger breaks or? So we call it, we just call it the envelope. People, you know, among the staff, everyone knows. I mean, all the staff does knows when you get an envelope from a child, you know what the colored writing on it is and you know what you need to do with it. For, for the camper, it's getting the special job. Can you take this message to, you know, whoever it is. And sometimes it'll be a message all the way across camp did to Dave on the climbing wall because we need a longer walk. And of course, they're always walking with one of their unit assistants. They always have, you know, a preferred counselor with them as well. But just kind of a fun thing and it makes them feel special and we're able to kind of look at what they need. Hold on, a preferred counselor? Is that the terminology? Yeah. For, okay, so you know with any of your <laughs> campers, especially those with um, inclusion campers, they, they are drawn to certain counselors and it may not be their inclusion aid, right? It may be that it's the counselor for the group over and that's a super opportunity to be able to foster a relationship with another counselor, um, but still in a safe and secure yeah, environment. I got you. I just thought, I thought maybe you called your inclusion aides preferred counselors. I just, that's what I was thinking. <laughs> we call them shadow counselors. We, call them, we got call them shadows. What do you call them, uh, Sam? The one-on-one, -on -one, but there's always, they're always paired with a normal counselor. So they're not called out differently very often. Mm -hmm. And Aaron, what do you call them at Robin Hood? I will, we call it, we have a, I guess a department called the camp relations department. And so they're, they're referred to typically as, you know, camp relations uh, counselors. Yeah, we've been calling, Terry and I have been calling them advocates and buddies. Um, we're, you know, could be something different next year. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> All right, uh, Aaron, why don't you keep going? Tell us about your tip of the week. Sure. So, uh, as uh, as I mentioned before, Sari, the co-owner of Robinhood, is the is the sort of the guru on this stuff. So I'm going to uh, steal one of her uh, one of her ideas that I thought was in, very impactful for me when uh, I participated in in this during our uh, senior staff training, and it was a sens sensory immersion um, exercise that we uh, all the staff uh, went into a dark room, blindfolded, uh, and different. Uh, objects and different uh, types of uh, stimulus stimuli were uh, applied to uh, to us all at sort of all at the same time. Uh, whether it was you know being rubbed with a uh, you know a, a rough brush or tickled on the back of the neck or uh, hearing loud banging noises, um, just a, you know an exercise that really uh, got 
you know, got us thinking and uh, led to a great discussion on, you know, the way that some of these uh, children, you know, and it was, you know, mentioned, uh, Terry, by you with the Harmony Hut, where you have to, you know, sometimes take a break from, uh, you know, what's going on. It's hard for, you know, um, people that are not involved in this world to really understand, you know, what those ca cameras are going through. So for me, that was a really impactful um, exercise. And it's easy to put together, very inexpensive. You you know, they were, we were, I think they were using toilet brushes and feathers and, you know, paper towels and drums and whatever it was that they had just to create this uh, environment. And different people had, uh, you know, a few different people had different um you know, were treated differently, I guess, in terms of how they're, you know, how, how much stimulus were, were being applied to them. And so it led to some great discussion, helped us understand the campers better uh, going into the summer. And, uh, you know, and, and while we did it with our senior staff on, on mass, we then, you know, allowed the senior staff to take it back to their counselors and, uh, you know, and, and, and use a modified version of it. So it was a great, uh, great exercise that I recommend uh, anyone try if you, if you want your counsel counselors to have a good understanding of this stuff. Yeah. Or, or you could just say, hey, remember those fidget spinners you used to have? <laughs> All right. They'll play with one in the car when I'm stressed. <laughs> All right, Sam, bring us home. All right. So um, I've got a craft this week, but it's for children that have fine motor problems. Um, so sidewalk chalk, first of all, is usually use, you use your whole arm while you're doing sidewalk chalk. So you don't have to have as good a fine motor. It's more large motor. But if you make your own sidewalk chalk out of egg cartons, you just need plaster of Paris, a little bit of water, and a couple dots of whatever color paint in each of the 12 little cups. And um, you let it dry for two to three days. And then when you peel off the egg carton, you've got big chunks that they can hang on to. I've also seen it done with um, uh, toilet wrapper or toilet roll tubes, because you know how they're kind of a big thick um, width. If you put duct tape on the bottom, put uh, wax paper on the inside and pour your, your plaster of Paris with your paint in it down the tube, let it dry for a couple days. When you peel it, then they've got this big thick that they can use their whole fist to hold on to, to make their sidewalk chalk. So then they can use a big fist and big large motor motions. Awesome, vintage Sam Thompson, Crystal Lake Park. That's, it's really awesome. Uh, I just hope you're chronicling all these things, Sam, and they're somewhere so that somebody can put a book together because you've got such great ideas. Thank you, Miss Lucia Tenson. Thank you, Miss Terry Sutherland. Thank you for sh sharing your inclusion knowledge and what you do with your camps and your campers and your staff uh, to the world. Because we're seeing that it's just a matter of time. Everybody's learning about this thing. It's going to start catching on. It is catching on. All right. And we are making a difference. So uh, we encourage you all to take on a few more inclusion kids and give it a whirl. Um, it's it's very very rewarding on all ends all right it is win-win across the board matter of fact it's like win 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 if you think of all the parties involved uh, we want to thank our producer matt hansberger and travis allison from the go Pam pro team our dedicated sponsors aca new york new jersey commercial recreation specialists and am skyer for allowing us to bring this podcast to you if you don't want to miss an episode of the day camp pod then you should subscribe and if you like what you're hearing then give us a nice rating while you're at it Check out our show notes from this and other episodes at daycamppodcast.com, as well as contact information for the show, our, our guests, and our awesome hosts, Sam and Aaron. Um, thank you for listening and, and making yourself a better camp professional. We'll be back real soon with another episode of the Day Camp Pod.